Welcome to St. Giles Presbyterian Church. We are a community of faith in the heart of the Glebe, and we seek to share Christ's vision for the world uh, and to respond in a Christ-like manner to present-day challenges. My name is Paul Wu. I'm a minister of the congregation, and I'll be leading worship this morning. Just a word of thanks uh, for last week's coffee hour uh, and uh, Kathy, one of the person that prepared the coffee hour, uh, would like me to acknowledge her friend, uh, uh, Shahida Yaman, uh, who prepared the snacks for last week. Uh, she's a, a Muslim friend uh, of, of Kathy, and uh, even though <coughs> uh, we may be of different faith tradition, but she was more than happy to give her time and, and, uh, and prepare the snacks. Uh, for last week's coffee hour. Uh, we remember her also in our prayers uh, for she's having some trouble at, at her work. So, um, and, uh, so please convey our uh, appreciation and, uh, and, and to her and also that she's remembered in our prayers. <clears throat> this is uh, our uh, last week in this sermon series, a seven-part sermon series on the mountain of Israel. And uh, after this Sunday, uh, we're going into a five weeks uh, joint summer services. And this is part of uh, a number of four congregations in the Glebe area uh, that shares summer services, joint summer, summer services. Uh, and uh, for the month of July and parts of August. <clears throat> so uh, the, the schedule is in the bulletin and it's also online. Uh, if you go to St. Giles website, uh, there's a page uh, where it would have link uh, that would take you to uh, these congregations. So if you want to join uh, online, uh, you're, you're able to do so as well. Just a, a personal note uh, that I am uh, heading out uh, to Gracefield after uh, our service uh, today, uh, and I will be uh, volunteering my time there as a chaplain for the for this coming week. Uh, and July 13th, uh, I will be heading out to Vancouver, uh, spending two weeks there with my in-laws. So I'm looking really looking forward to that. It's been three years uh, since I saw them. So, uh, but. Uh, hopefully, cross our finger, things will, will be okay. There's lots of uh, uncertainties as to whether uh, that actually will happen or not. So, but anyway, that's a schedule, and I'll be returning on the 28th. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, our worship here at St. Giles will resume on August 14th, uh, the Sunday of August 14th. Um, a word on the land acknowledgement. Uh, so the, uh, the territory uh, where we are gathered uh, and worship here is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. The Algonquin people has been living here since time immemorial, and we are honored that we are able to gather in this land. The responsive call to worship, it's printed in the bulletin. Uh, this call to worship uh, is adopted from Revelation 21, uh, and you will see uh, uh, that theme of that heavenly Jerusalem uh, is central in our focus of our worship today. So please join me in this response of call to worship. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Prepare as a bride, a door for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, see, the home of God is among mortals. The Lord will dwell with us. We will be God's people. God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for God is making all things new. Let us now sing hymn 410, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore You.
Let us come together in this prayer of adoration and the unison prayer of confession. Let us pray. God of majesty and mercy, in creation you gave us all that we need to live and all that we can cherish. You came to us in Jesus Christ to show us the face of your love. You walk into our lives to meet us in the midst of joy and pain. Through the Holy Spirit, you speak words of wisdom to help us find our way. O oh God, in our midst, speak to us today in this time of worship. Speak the words that we need to hear so that we know you still walk with us in Jesus Christ. For we honor you, source, savior, and spirit of life, one God, now and forever. And our prayer conclude, uh, continues with this unison prayer of confession. Loving God, you sent us into the world as ambassadors of your love and peace. Yet too often we create discord and division. We prioritize our own interests first, neglecting those in need. We value our understanding of the world you love and fail to listen to the stories of others. Forgive us for such self-centeredness. Help us to be more faithful disciples of Jesus, eager to serve, willing to listen, glad to be of service in his name. And our prayer concludes with the prayer that the Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Apostle Paul declared to us that from now on, we, reg we regard no one from a human point of view. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away and everything has become new. Thanks be to God. And by God's mercy, we can all make a new start. Amen. Our scripture reading passages, first reading is from Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. Uh, this is uh, a fairly early part of the vision of Isaiah. Uh, and that vision invites all hearers to come before the mountain of the Lord. And the second reading uh, is taken from Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 18 to 24. Um, and just prior to uh, chapter 12, we have this major section uh, where the writer of Hebrew discuss uh, faith uh, and, and faith of number of individual uh, and that culminate uh, into uh, the example of faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, and here in chapter 12, uh, what that, the result of all that discussion uh, come to a sort of a conclusion uh, in this reading. And Kathy will lead us uh, in these, these readings. A reading from Isaiah. 2, 1 to 5. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established at the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. 
For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come let us walk in the light of the Lord. This responsive reading is from Psalm 48, 1 to 3, and 9 to 14. Is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God God's holy mountain beautiful in elevation is the joy of all the earth Mount Zion in the far north the city of the great king within its citadels God has proven a sure defense why ponder your steadfast love O God we we ponder your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. Your name, O God, like your praise, reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with victory. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Walk about Zion. Go all around it. Count its towers. Consider well its ramparts. Go through its citadels, that you may tell the next generation that this is God. Our God forever and ever. He will be our guide forever. have not come to something that can be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that not another word be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even an animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned to death. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. This is the word of the Lord.
became a dream so fair. I stood in old Jerusalem beside the temple there. I heard the children singing and ever as they sang, methought the voice of angels from heaven in answer
Uh, let me just say thank you, Katie. And for the past little while that you've been with us, uh, we have really been blessed by your voice, by your enthusiasm, and thank you. And, and I wish that we are a packed house to hear what you have just uh, given to us, uh, but it is not to be, and uh, that is our fault. Uh, but uh, we have always appreciate uh, really that it doesn't matter how many people are in, in attendance, uh, you always give your all. Uh, and I think that speaks of your faith. Uh, and I know that your family is in, in attendance today, so it gives you that extra incentive. Uh, but you know, I, I truly believe that, um, that we are blessed by your presence. So thank you. Before we begin the sermon, uh, please join me in uh, this prayer. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We have journeyed far and wide. For the past six weeks, and we have visited a number of mountains of Israel, or more specifically, mountains that have played a significant part uh, in the faith life of the people of God. We started in Mount Moriah, where the faith of Abraham was tested uh, to see if he would hold anything back from God. He passed the test, by his willingness to sacrifice even his own son, Isaac. We learn not only that Abraham was indeed worthy to be called the father of faith, uh, but we also learn that ultimately, God provides. At the burning bush of Mount Horab, we saw Moses first call by God uh, to return to Egypt to deliver God's people from oppression and slavery. We learned a lesson in obedience, in answering God's call, and but more importantly, that we learn that in spite of our own shortcomings, ultimately God's will shall be done. At the foothill of Mount Sinai, we witnessed the receiving of the Ten Commandments through Moses. And through that unfortunate and ugly episode of the golden calf, uh, we also learn to wait upon the Lord and not to set oneself above God. At Mount Jerusalem, the mountain of God, we saw Israel build a magnificent and holy edifice that is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. We saw also how a false theology misled the people of God to trust in that temple instead of trusting in God. We learned that no earthly structure product of our collective hands could ever, ever contain nor control the holy God of Israel. Only our, 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 our rightful response uh, before this holy God uh, is that of humility, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. Micah chapter 6, verse 8. At the hill of Samaria, uh, along with the twin peaks of Ebal and Gerizim, uh, we saw how the divided kingdom of the northern Israel uh, tried and failed miserably uh, to tailor, make a twisted religion uh, to suit their own political agenda. We learned that God is spirit, 
And we could never recreate God in our own image. And through a simple dialogue, a discourse uh, between Jesus and the Samaritan woman, uh, we also learn to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And last week, I took you on the journey to Mount Megiddo, the site of a battle that is yet to come. We learned that in this future battle between good and evil, the Lord God Almighty, the God of hosts, the God of the angel armies is firmly in control. It's kind of like a, a rig game, a rig contest where the outcome uh, is already determined. Good shall triumph over evil. And the people of God could only, only give praise and stand in awe. And now today, we come to the final chapter of this seven parts sermon series, and we find ourselves at Jerusalem again, also known as Mount Zion, the mountain of God. In the vision of prophet Ezekiel, Oh, sorry, prophet Isaiah, uh, in chapter 2, 1 to 5, he foresaw in days to come that Jerusalem, the mountain of the Lord's house, shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above all the hills. People and nations will stream to it, seeking to be taught the ways of of the Lord, uh, and so that they can walk in God's path. Isaiah prophesied at a time when the first temple of Jerusalem was still standing. His vision makes no distinction between the earthly Jerusalem and the eschatological Mount Zion, as he could not have imagined a possibility that the city of Jerusalem and the temple within it uh, could one day be no more. That possibility became a reality in the time of prophet Ezekiel. Last week I, I spoke about a series of vision that Ezekiel had concerning the end time uh, and the focus was last week on chapter 38 and 39 uh, and, and the vision of that final battle uh, triggered by a leader of the north, uh, Gog from the land of Magog. <clears throat> what follows after the battle uh, is another vision, a rather long vision uh, recorded in chapter 40 to 48. Uh, a vision providing detailed specifications uh, of a newly constructed temple built on top of an unspecified, a very high mountain in the land of Israel. It should be stressed that in that vision, the prophet did not see a blueprint. Rather, he saw an actual temple, an actual structure, he was given the tour of the, this newly constructed temple by a guide uh, wearing white linen and holding a measuring reed in his hand uh, who took pain to measure every corner of that temple. And thus giving the prophet and thus us as hearers of these chapters uh, a workable blueprint for future construction. However, no one in history has ever attempted to build that temple according to the given specification. Quite frankly, it would be impossible to do so on the top of Mount Jerusalem. The overall size of the temple uh, is, uh, the temple compound is so immense that it simply could not fit on top of Mount Jerusalem. 
So let me try to describe uh, this difficulty by comparing uh, it to a familiar size of, let's say, a Canadian football field. Bigger than the American football field, mind you. In the time of 40 years of wandering uh, in the wilderness, the presence of God uh, among the people of God uh, is symbolized by the tabernacle, and literally a very large tent. The core of the tabernac <coughs> tabernacle, it's about one third of a football field. So that gives you a bit of idea of how big the size of the tabernacle. The first temple built by Solomon uh, with all the fine craftsmanship, the best material, uh, woods from Lebanon, and, and gold adorning the arch, uh, and, and, and that, that magnificent edifice um, is only about half of a football field, so slightly bigger than the tabernacle. The second temple built by the returnee those who were exiled in the land of Babylon uh, that returned uh, under, uh, in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. Now that temple was vastly expanded uh, in the time of King Herod, uh, also called Herod the Great. Now Herod was known to, to, to construct a number of magnificent buildings, uh, palaces, fortification, and, and the second temple. But in order to do so, Herod had to flatten out the base of the Temple Mount and build a, a giant, giant supporting wall uh, with giant rocks and boulders uh, on the western face. Even though the second temple is no longer in existence now, uh, but the engineering feat of Herod in building that base uh, is still visible today. And when you go to the city of Jerusalem in Israel, uh, you can see that temple wall. The total size of that vastly expanded second temple, it's about one and a half football field. That's pretty big. Now, what then is the size of Ezekiel's vision of a new temple? Well, it's about six Canadian football field, four times larger than that second temple, the expanded second temple. So what it means that even if one were to raise the entire city of Jerusalem, it will still not fit that temple. Reading these visions of Ezekiel, one starts to get a sense that the temple and the city that the prophet saw is really out of this world. I should know that these visions of Ezekiel have given rabbis of Israel no end of trouble. They detail not just physical dimension of the temple, but cultic practices uh, that are sometimes familiar, uh, but at other times distinctly different than that of Judaism. Now, if these visions were indeed carried out precisely and literally, a Judaism in the time of Jesus uh, would have looked and felt quite different than what we read, what we read in the New Testament. The vision of out of this world temple and the city that supports it would find a new expression uh, in the vision of St. John in the book of Revelation. While exiled to the island of Patmos uh, in about seven, uh, 90 uh, years after death, uh, Apostle John wrote down a series of visions uh, of the apocalypse, future events of 
unimaginable horror culminating in the new heaven and the new earth of unimaginable joy. In chapter 21, verse 2, John also described seeing the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from out of heaven from God. Prepare as a bride adorned for her husband. John went into great detail describing uh, this new Jerusalem, yet he saw in verse 22, no temple in the city. For its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, referring to Jesus Christ. It would appear that in this new world order, the temple which symbolizes the presence of God is no longer needed. For the Lord God, the tabernacle of God, is among the mortals. God will dwell with us, and we will be God's people. In this heavenly Jerusalem, God will wipe away all tears, as mourning and crying and pain will be no more. Death will be no more. as the Lord is making all things new. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? As our journey winds down, allow me to conclude the seven-part sermon series of the mountains of Israel with this passage in Hebrew chapter 12. I think the author of Hebrews uh, is really good at tying major themes, uh, themes from the Old Testament uh, and the New Testament together in a cohesive whole. Listen to his passionate exhortation. You have not come to something that can be touched, a blazing fire, a darkness, a gloom, and a tempest, uh, and the sound of a trumpet, and a voice whose words made the heaven beg that not another word be spoken to them. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, judge of all, and to the spirit of righteous made perfect and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. The blood of Abel being the first murder, innocent victim, shouts from the ground for vengeance and justice, yet the sprinkled blood of Christ proclaimed to us plainly from the cross for the message of shalom of forgiveness, of reconciliation, and a message of eternal salvation. That indeed is a better word. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. As we come to the prayers of the people, I'd like to invite you to do, it, do this responsively. So when you hear the word God of all earth, 
Please respond, teach us to live in love. So God of all the earth, teach us to live in love. Let us pray. Creator God, source of all life and each life, we come to you in prayer this day, grateful that your world is full of wonder and possibility, but also in desperate need of your reconciling love. We pray for the many different peoples of this world. Divided as we are into many nations, clans, cultures, and spiritual traditions. Help us understand these differences more fully and honor the good things that bind us together despite differences. Bless both our diversity and our unity as those who belong to you. O God of all the earth, teach us to live in love. Loving God, source of truth and wisdom, in the world we are confronted by powers and authorities. Help us recognize their potential for both good and evil and act wisely and faithfully to discern whom to trust and when to act. When we see injustice or recognize falsehood, Give us the courage to speak up. Speak up in Christ's name. Open our eyes to our own weakness and bias and speak to us through the example of Jesus our Lord. O God of all the earth, teach us to live in love. Compassionate God, the world is filled with violence and hatred costing innocent lives we sometimes feel powerless to do anything about it. Today our hearts ache for those whose lives amid, who live amid brutal conflict and, and for those uh, have died through violence and for those who suffer the many effects of trauma. We pray for those who have lost their homes through conflict and fled their countries just to survive. Open our hearts and homes to welcome those who flee and protect those who, stray, uh, who stay uh, amid conflicts to offer care and threaten many places in the world these days. O oh God of all the earth, Teach us to live in love. O oh, knowing God, you see into our hearts and know the heartache we carry. We pray for those living with illness and pain and for those who mourn the loss of someone or something dear. And for all those struggling with anxiety or despair in these challenging times. O oh God of all the earth, teach us to live in love. Wise and welcoming God, give us the grace to live out our faith among families and friends and among acquaintances and strangers so that we may truly live out our callings as ambassadors of your good news. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us now sing the hymn, Christ Be Our Light. The lyrics is in the bulletin. Thank you. 
I can't even hear him. Uh, hi, Bob. Hello there. Oh, Blessings to you. Okay. Blessing to you, too. And, uh, uh, Cheryl. Yes, so, good morning. Cheryl, Blessings to all of you. You're from uh, Windsor, right? Correct. That's right. Yes, I remember you. Hi, Jerry. Hi, Bob. Hi, Bob. Good to see Hi, you. Carol. Hi, Bob. Yes. Um, let me acknowledge also Bill White. Hi, Bill. Hi. I just want to thank Katie and have a safe drive to Gracefield. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Katie, say thank you, Bill. Um, let me acknowledge Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Buddy, may the peace of Christ be with everybody. Yes, thank you, and also with you. Uh, I saw briefly Barbara. Good morning and peace to everyone. 
Good to hear from you, Barbara. Is David with you? <coughs> it's okay. Your your video is coming in and out. <laughs> yes. Um, let me acknowledge those who are in person and uh, our music director Heather, uh, our vocalist uh, Katie, and uh, Daisy. Uh, I see Kathy, our scripture reader today. Jean and Stan, good morning. Uh, and this is Katie's family, so that's Reverend Ed Grattan, uh, Joy and Kim. I hope I got your name correct. Good. Yeah. Uh, I see Megan. Hi, Megan. Good to see you. Uh, I see Jen. Hello, Jen. Uh, and Nick. Hi, Nick. Um, and our uh, duty elder Isaac standing at the back. Uh, I see Jenny. Hi, Jenny. It's been a number of weeks. I hope that you're well. Guy, you can join us. And uh, I see Don and Kay. Uh, and uh, providing technical support is Justin at the corner. Peace of Christ be with each and every one of you. And with also you. With you. Also with you. begin with a very brief announcement for those of you who intend to uh, join us for the joint services next week. Do note that the start time at Glebe St. James is 10 a.m. Um, other things over the summer are on hiatus. Uh, coffee hour will resume on August 15th. Bible study will resume on Friday, August 19th at 10 a.m. We've got an upcoming communion on the 28th of August at 10.30, and choir practice will reconvene on September the 8th. Uh, also, looking way ahead, there's a Teze service on the 28th of September at 7 p.m. So there will be coffee and refreshments after this service, and I would like to say I invite you, but I would almost implore you uh, to come down and join us at all possible. Thank you. As the offering is being collected and brought forward, uh, <clears throat> we're reminded that through the visions of Ezekiel, John, uh, and the author of Hebrews, um, <clears throat> we're reminded of the new heaven and new earth the kingdom of God that is both here uh, and not yet, uh, yet to come. Through our gifts to God, uh, we participate in the building of that kingdom uh, in the world that God loves. So whatever you give, give with the confidence that God will use these gifts uh, for the good purpose uh, of the good news. Let us stand and sing the doxology. O generous God, you have blessed our lives with gifts, both visible and invisible. We offer our gifts in gratitude, 
to build up your kingdom in the world. Bless that all we give to make a difference in the lives of others. For the sake of Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us now sing our closing hymn, uh, 775, Sent Forth by God's Blessing. Uh, we are using a, an, an alternate lyric uh, that is printed in the bulletin. the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you from this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>